morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Maria Recio. I'm a correspondent in the McClatchy Bureau, and I write for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and the um, Sun-Herald from Mississippi. I uh, wanted to let you know that as co-chair of uh, the Newsmakers Committee, I sometimes get to pick which uh, events I wanted to host. And when I saw the uh, title uh, of this event, uh, Modern Families, Outdated Laws, I said, well, that's me. And I have two very good reasons for doing that, my daughters, Alexa and Alana. So I want to welcome you all to this event sponsored by the National Center for Policy Analysis and the National Press Club Newsmaker Committee. And uh, I'm going to start off by, uh, first of all, introducing the Honorable Pete DuPont, uh, who is over here, a uh, gentleman over here, distinguished uh, looking, who many of you uh, may recall as a presidential candidate, and of course, a very distinguished political career as uh, in, the, in, this, in the Assembly in Delaware, and a congressman and governor. And uh, Mr. DuPont now is the, uh, writes a regular column. So we're glad that he's in our profession, too. And, um, the uh, moderator of today's event will be uh, John Goodman, here immediately to my right. Uh, he is the uh, founder of the National Center for Policy Analysis, which is based in Dallas, and uh, has served as president since uh, its founding in 1983. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called Dr. Goodman the father of health savings account for his advocacy of uh, those wonderful savings uh, devices. And today, he's going to enlighten us uh, about uh, laws that need changes uh, changed to help modern families. Thank you. Well, welcome all of you. I'm fortunate enough to uh, be the uh, head of the board of the National Center for Policy Analysis, so John Goodman tells me what to do every day, uh, and I do it. So, uh, so here I am. Um, you are about to uh, learn from the excellent group of speakers you see uh, here at the podium. You're about to learn about this book. And uh, it is uh, full of interesting information. It's full of interesting perspectives. But you're going to learn about such things as uh, why the tax system is not fair to a two-earning, uh, two-earner couples, uh, why um, uh, labor law and the 40-hour work week is making it very difficult for women to uh, adjust their working schedule to take care of the kids uh, and work in their jobs. Uh, tax relief for health insurance is an enormous problem. Um, health insurance benefits aren't portable, as you know. As you move from your job today to your job next, uh, your next job, you may not be able to take those health care uh, benefits uh, or health care um, uh, programs that you have with you. Uh, Social Security uh, is not exactly fair. Uh, it's not fair at all uh, to uh, women who work. Uh, so all of that is contained in this book and we are fortunate enough to have with us today a number of speakers who are going to provide a little perspective on it and then of course there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. My job then is to uh, introduce uh, Karen Zarnecki, who's going to be our first speaker. She's senior advisor to uh, Secretary of Labor Elaine Chow. Uh, she is uh, working on improving competitiveness uh, in a, in a dynamic, dynamic economy. Deputy assistant, Deputy assistant Secretary of Labor for Intergovernmental Affairs. And my goodness, before that, she was the Director of Civil Justice and Health and Human Services Task Force at the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which of course is a wonderful organization that gives us all the information we need to know about what needs to be done in the Congress. She worked in the Reagan White House for uh, the first President Bush, uh, and a special assistant to Vice President Quayle, uh, and she is going to be uh, our introductory speaker this morning, and so uh, welcome uh, Karen Zarnecki. He forgot to tell you that I'm still 21 and I keep telling my kids that every birthday that I have. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I should mention to both you and John Goodman that um, uh, the National Center for Policy Analysis has done wonderful work as evidenced by the fact that my staff is emailing me on a regular basis every week items from your daily digest. So you are making a big dent with a lot of folks who are policymakers in the administration and on the Hill, I'm sure. Um, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of Secretary of Labor, Elaine L. Chow. As many of you know, Secretary Chow has made 
women in the labor, um, in the workforce, a priority of this administration. Under the Secretary's leadership, the department has hosted five women's entrepreneurship summits around the country. We host a women's business portal, women-21.gov, that my office runs. <clears throat> and we've also hosted many forums to discuss issues that you'll be discussing today, such as workplace flexibility. The underlying premise of this book and the discussion today is that since the 1950, the percent of women participating in the workforce has more than doubled and now stands at 75%. Most of these women are working full-time, not part-time, as was the case in decades past. Another issue that's going to be discussed, I hope, at length today is the tax code. It's a real sticking point. We all know the tax code has changed many times since 1950. Presidents Bush, Clinton, and Reagan made significant changes to the tax code. But these changes in tax law have not taken into account the structural changes in the workforce, in families, and the stepped up role of working women. For those who are used to Washington policies, it's not hard to understand why. It can take years in Congress to get a law passed, and it normally takes two to four years to get a regulation through any federal cabinet agency. Um, we know because we've been through that a couple of times at the Labor Department. Sometimes it can take much, much longer than that. For example, one of our signature achievements in the Labor Department of this administration has been forming the regulations which affect overtime pay for white collar workers. Every administration since Jimmy Carter had tried to reform what is called Section 541 of the overtime regulations. It was based on overtime rules that were first issues issued in 1939 and had remained virtually unchanged since 1949. Recent immigrants, minorities, low-skilled workers were especially harmed because they could be classified as exempt under the rules and denied overtime pay if their annual pay exceeded a threshold of $8,060. Under the old rules, a worker could be paid less than the individual federal poverty line and yet be classified as an executive and not um, and not receiving overtime pay. Unfortunately, a disproportionate number of those workers in those lower skilled, lower paying jobs were women. When the overtime rules were first created for a manufacturing dominated economy, it was a lot easier to tell the difference between managers and rank and file employees. Management and labor worked in different places, wore different clothing, and performed very different functions. Today, many of those distinctions have blurred yet the government's classification of who is and who is not entitled to overtime had remained the same. The old rules even refer to job titles that no longer exist, such as straw boss, leg man, and gang leader. And I will give a dollar to anyone in this room who can tell me what any of those jobs are because everyone we've surveyed on Capitol Hill, the federal bureaucracy, people who've worked at labor for 30 years do not know what those jobs were. So it was time for us to change those about a year and a half ago. Um, those of you who did follow those white-collar overtime rule changes knew that it was a Herculean effort, not be just because of the final outcome we wanted to achieve, but because we wanted to make change, uh, lasting change. Another one of the recent accomplishments in Congress has been pension reform. Uh, this required both a leg legislative and regulatory effort, which made it even more difficult after cases as Enron, WorldCom, and other companies had put a spotlight on the issue and we really needed to move forward on this. Among the many provisions of the bill, uh, workers can save for retirement through IRAs and 401ks. What the bill will automatically allow is automatic enrollment for employees in defined contribution plans unless they opt out. And I know uh, our Department of Labor is going to be working on those regulations for the next couple of years. It ensures that workers have more information about the performance of those accounts provides greater access to professional advice about investing for retirement, and gives workers control over how those accounts are invested. Now, the question is, uh, why is this important? Why should we care? Why should families care? Why should women care? Well, statistics show that women are more risk averse in money matters, and they invest more conservatively. Poll after poll, no matter who has done it, has really shown this. And allowing investment advice alone will benefit women and women who head up families because they're not typically trained in their early years about money matters and investments. But sometimes even a looming crisis can't motivate the legislative or regulatory machine to move forward. The best example, as you all know, is President Bush's Social Security reform proposal. Uh, we all know the system is going broke in 2041. 
And I personally hope it doesn't take until that time that we make some reforms that would be good for all Americans, but for families in particular. But the good news is we're moving forward with the debate. Even if it takes an act of God to get legislation passed or a regulation through the process, we all know uh, that this is a lot of what our panelists are going to be discussing today and should be a very lively discussion. This book and this panel today are a fantastic starting point to stir a national debate about these issues. And I think we do need fair government policies that not only affect women, but modern American families. And that's something the left, the right, can agree on. So please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Thank you, Karen, for those remarks. Again, I'm John Goodman, president of the National Center for Policy Analysis, and uh, I'm glad all of you were able to join us uh, this morning. Uh, if you're a policy wonk like I am, you see a lot of silly regulations and a lot of ridiculous laws, but no matter how many you see, you never tire of asking yourself, what could members of Congress possibly be thinking when they pass this or when they pass that? And having gone through that, that, that question and conceivable answers uh, many, many times, eventually it dawned on all of us at the NCPA that, uh, that we began to understand what they were thinking about. They were thinking about families that were living totally different lives than the way people live today. And I think what we've done in this book is hit some of the high points. We, we grabbed some of the low-hanging fruit. But as Karen tells us, buried deep in the, the, the various regulations of the federal government, there are many, many more issues that we didn't even get to. And what's probably needed is a commission to just go from top to bottom through all of the federal laws and uh, uh, bring them all into the 21st century. All right, to kick this off, uh, I'm going to turn to Kimberly Strassel, who is my favorite author. And uh, <laughs> she has always been a delight to work with. And, and uh, I, when I couldn't say something in a way that would be appealing to, to readers, she would come along and, and make it much better. And Kimberly, I'm very, very thankful for all that you've done to make this a successful book. She's a Wall Street Journal columnist, and uh, she's on the editorial board of the journal. And you may have seen her just this week uh, talking about uh, Elliot Spitzer. Was that your, your column? Very good column. All right, please join me in welcoming Kim Strassel. You know, it's very funny. We wrote this whole book about how difficult it is to live in a modern family. Never get enough sleep, too many kids, not enough money. And my husband and son went away for starting on Saturday, and I thought, ooh, be a single girl for a week. And I've been behaving as such, staying up too late, drinking too much, and generally feeling unwell every minute of the day. So I've decided it's easier to be a modern family than it is to be single anymore. Um, you know, back in 1940, uh, two-thirds of working households out there were what would be what you would call traditional. Uh, men went to work, women stayed at home. Not only did the men go to work and women stay at home, but men worked in very traditional ways. They worked full-time, they worked at companies that they worked for their entire life. Um, they got most of their benefits through that company. They didn't go in and out of the workforce to raise families. They were there and they stayed there. Um, they didn't worry about things like retirement or social security as much because often by the time they retired, they, they would die not long after. Um, this happened to be the time when most of our elected leaders and policymakers were coming up devising some of the institutions uh, and laws that still govern our economic behavior even today. Uh, Social Security, tax law, Medicare, Medicaid, benefits law, labor law. And while America has dramatically changed, those institutions have not. Today, two-thirds of working households are, in fact, uh, have both spouses in the workplace, so it's almost exactly opposite. Not only that, uh, the second earners in the house, which often tend to be women, work in very different ways than at any time in the past. They work part-time so that they can juggle uh, their house life and their work life. They go in and out of the workforce to raise children, to look after elderly relatives. They switch jobs. Uh, they uh, have to worry about an increasingly com uh, difficult environment for getting benefits, uh, ones that work for their family, and they're often in charge of making those decisions. This book is about how these laws have not changed to keep pace with this new world in America. 
And I was going to give you two quick examples just to bring it home, uh, and two that, that tend to resonate with a lot of Americans in particular because they deal with those two big issues, time and money. One, which has been alluded to here briefly, is tax law. Uh, women often still tend to be second earners in the house. Now that is changing. Often you have men who are second earners. You also have some more single parents out there today. But women do tend to be second earners. Um, women often find that, let's say they took time out from the workforce to raise children or they're going in for the first time. Um, they go get a job. Because we are in a marginal tax rate system, what they first discover is that the money they earn is added in with their husbands and is taxed at a higher rate. Sometimes the fact that the woman is working puts both partners into a higher tax rate. Um, moreover, often women will find when they go back that all of the things that they had been taking care at home, now they need to actually pay someone else to do. Child care, housework. Uh, ordering in dinners from the Chinese food place rather than making them on your own. When you add all this in together, federal taxes, payroll taxes, state taxes, local taxes, and also all these other benefits, I spoke to many women who wanted a career, who wanted to go out to work, but in the end decided that it would actually be economically disadvantageous to them to go back to work. So that's one example. The other one, and I think this resonates even more because it's something we all deal with all the time, is workplace flexibility, and Karen mentioned it. Um, when, back in 1938, this country passed something called the Fair Labor Standards Act. It set up the 40-hour work week. It was a good idea at the time, or at least we thought it was, in that it was supposed to protect employees from abusive companies, not make them work too long. You had to be, be paid time and a half. Today, there are many couples out there that rather than being paid time and a half, would like to have some sort of flexible scheduling option, where say, they worked 50 hours one week, but 30 hours the next, so that they could go pick up their kids after school or attend some soccer matches. There are many companies that would prefer this situation. There are many workers who would prefer this situation. But our laws don't actually allow it to happen. They demand time and a half. Now, what's interesting is that the federal government realized this was a problem all the way back in the 1970s. And they do allow uh, workplace flexibility, uh, an option that almost half of federal employees take advantage of. It's been very successful. But when Senator John Ashcroft attempted to pass similar legislation for the private workforce in the 1990s, he was defeated by Democrats and unions. So as John said, there's a lot of issues out there. This is just a couple of them. They're in the book. We try to explain them. Um, I think that what he said was correct. We actually do need some sort of big vision, maybe a commission that looks at these things from top to bottom. But in the meantime, you can get an idea of some of the problems and some of the solutions that we have by reading the book. Um, I'm very happy to see you all here today, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Dee Dee Myers uh, was the first woman and youngest person ever to serve as White House Press Secretary. She probably needs no introduction here today from me. She is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair, and she's got a new book that's coming out in a couple of months, so, so watch for that. It's going to be a good one. Dee Dee. Thank you, John. Um, thank you. It's, uh, somebody has to represent the other side of the political spectrum here. Um, the first thing I just want to reiterate what Kim said, that um, how much the uh, workforce has changed with the entry of women. And it's not just an American issue, it's a global issue. There was a report in The Economist a few months back that said that the entry of women in the, into the workforce in the rich countries of the world has contributed more to global GDP than either new technology or the new giants, India and China. And obviously that trend is going to continue as economic development continues around the world. So this is a trend. Women are not going back into the private sector. Um, and I think we're going to see more women in the workplace and more uh, challenges as a result of that. Um, there's three points I want to make quickly. One is that women, uh, these problems disproportionately affect women. A lot of the problems outlined in the book disproportionately affect women now. But as, as the workforce continues to change on a broader level, it's going to affect everybody. So women are just on the point. They're cutting edge of some of these issues that will change as, work, as workers change jobs repeatedly throughout the course of their lives, six, seven, eight jobs. As men and women trade, who's making more money at different points, who's working part time? I think there are going to be more options for both spouses, for single spouses parents and for everybody. And I think the workforce is going to continue to change in really important ways. The second point is that um, I think this is a bipartisan problem. 
It's not a conservative problem. It's not a liberal problem. It's a bipartisan problem that needs bipartisan solution. If a woman earns minimum wage and is taxed at her husband's rate, is that a conservative problem or a liberal problem? Or if a woman is widowed early with children at home, and Social Security gives you a couple of not very good options, right? You can either stay home and with the children and continue to receive your benefits, or you can risk losing those benefits or lose those benefits if you go back to the workforce. But if a woman chooses to stay home with her children and then the children leave, and now she has to go into the workforce with outdated skills, is that a liberal problem or a conservative problem? Um, so I think if you look across the spectrum of these problems, we realize this is something that I think issues that affect or concern both liberals and conservatives uh, for a lot of reasons, some of them different, and many, many, many of them the same. Um, the third point I want to make is that I think one of the ways, uh, one of the important things in addressing some of these problems is, w this is my own personal bugaboo, we need more women in elective office. Women bring, they're not better than men, they, they're not smarter than men, although sometimes, let's face it, we are. <laughs> um, we bring a different life experience. Um, and a lot of women who will find themselves in elected office at the state, local, federal, international level, uh, will have faced some of these challenges, and men increasingly as well. But I think um, by having more women who bring some of these challenges from their own lives into the legislative arena, I think we can have a, a, a dialogue about it. And I think women uh, can work together across partisan lines to solve this problem. I think this is a terrific basket of issues for a couple of um, smart and uh, caring legislators who want to take on this basket of problems to identify maybe some priorities and move forward. And I think a great place to go to look for some champions would be among the women in, in, in Congress. So um, anyway, those, th those are my points. And I, and I hope that this book brings additional attention to the whole basket of issues and at least starts a dialogue in the places where it needs to be discussed. Leslie Morgan Steiner is uh, the author of Mommy Wars, and uh, she's also a columnist for the Washington Post. And Leslie, you could speak from up here or, or from there, whichever you'd like. She put something about the book on her blog the other day, and by noon there were 50 pages of comments, and by 5 o'clock there were 80 pages, and I don't know how many comments are, are there now, but, um, but, but clearly we sparked uh, some issues that, uh, that were important to a lot, of, a lot of people, not just women. There were some men. Uh, a comedy as well. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Morgenstein. Thanks for that introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I come at this issue from kind of a different perspective versus the book. The book, to me, has so many wonderful numbers in it and incredibly powerful information. But what I have is information from moms. I've done really nothing but for the last five years except talk to moms everywhere I've went about the challenges that they face in combining or choosing not to combine, uh, working and raising kids. And I, did that, I started doing that as I was working on my book Mommy Wars, which is a collection of 26 essays by women with very different perspectives and women who've made very different choices about work and family. And then in March of this year I started writing this column for the Washington Post online that runs five days a week. And I thought at first that it would just be working moms who would be interested. But it turns out that there are a whole lot of stay-at-home moms who are interested, a lot of dads, a lot of teenagers, a lot of people without kids. Motherhood in this country is something that everybody has an opinion about. And my column, which is, I only write about 300 words and then the, the mob takes over. Um, is mostly just this intense conversation about anything having to do with parenthood in this country and how wonderful it is and how difficult it is. And as John was saying, last week I wrote an entry about the book and sometimes it, we, the, the, the column can get up to 600 comments a day um, and they're not brief comments. It can take hours to, to read through all of them. And they're, they're all really interesting. But because the, the blog is anonymous, um, people really, really say what they think. And it's a window into what people, you know, things that people wouldn't tell you in a forum like this. They wouldn't tell you this at a barbecue or at a back to school night. They really don't hold back. And it's the best thing about the blog, in my opinion, about blogs in general, is that it's a fascinating and sometimes really horrifying window into people's minds. Um, 
so I, before I get into what specifically people thought about the book um, and what I wrote about the book and what I think about it, um, I want to talk briefly just about a few numbers. Um, as I said, I'm not really long on numbers. I'm long on people's stories. But there are a few numbers that I wanted to bring to everybody's attention. And you probably know these already, but let me just state them. There are about 80 million moms in America today. The vast majority of them, over 70% um, of women with children 18 and under, work. There are only about 5.6 million stay-at-home moms, which is a lot, but it's nothing compared to the number of moms who are out there working. And just for any of you who are wondering, there are about 150,000 stay-at-home dads out there. Um, I see from my column that there is definitely a daddy track out there too, men who are really scaling back to be with their families in the way that women have been sort of derided for doing for years. Um, so the vast majority of moms are working. They are struggling to combine work and family. And more and more of them work full time because they have to. And they have to for financial re reasons, most of them, but it's worth noting that a lot of them have to work for other, I would argue, equally valid reasons to keep their short-term and long-term sanity. Um, and because we, work, we live in a country where work is everything. It's your value. Um, and it's particularly clear in this city, but it's clear across the country too. And the, the inequities um, and the unfair laws that are addressed in this book I what I see is that they send women the message that women's work is not equal to men's work. That it's not as valuable as men's work. It's not as valuable to this country. And you know, as we all know, laws and policies really reflect a society's values. And I believe that we are sending women, by keeping these laws, a message, this message, that they, they and their work are not equal to men. And this explains why it is so difficult for women in this country to feel like they are a success, no matter what their choices are about how much of themselves they give to work and how much they give to their families. I believe that what needs to be talked about in many ways is prejudice against women. And this country is arguably one of the best countries to live in, um, in terms of laws that protect women. But there is still, it's, I think that when you step back even just a little bit, you see how deep-seated and ubiquitous prejudice against women is, and it's hardly unique to the United States, but we have it here, and it's, it's very, very destructive. And the fundamental tension that I saw in Mommy Wars and in talking to women as I was writing the book and touring the country, promoting the book, and now with my column, is that in a capitalist country such as ours, your worth is really measured by how much you earn. And I'm not saying that that's right, and it's an uncomfortable thing to say to anyone. It's particularly an uncomfortable thing to say to a woman who has decided to stay home with her children and not earn anything. But it is what I see. This country values how much you earn. And so it makes it incredibly hard to be a stay-at-home mom with any self-esteem. Um, and that's a lot what Mommy Wars is about. But it makes it hard to be a woman in America, period, with any self-esteem. Because on average, um, we make so much less than men, and because there are laws, such as the ones outlined in this book, that are biased towards working men. When one of the, the books, the, a couple of the book's points that I really called out on my column, I wanted to spend just a minute talking about and talking about the reaction from people on the blog. Um, one of them was what's been already discussed here is the, the marginal tax policy. That if you are a woman who is working or thinking about going back to work, uh, you're going to be taxed essentially at your, your husband's rate if he earns more than you do. Um, some people might argue that it's you're taxed at your household's earning rate. Um, but what this often means is that when you go back to work, you are disproportionately disincentivized from going back. The other point that sort of goes along with this is that if you look at you know, taking out childcare expenses and household um, maintenance expenses from a woman's salary, the um, average middle income uh, working woman is gonna keep only 35 cents out of every dollar that she earns. Uh, so it's hard to get really motivated to go back to work when you're facing these kinds of hurdles. And I think that these, uh, these examples show how laws and policies can really, really reflect and shape um, our culture and how a woman ends up feeling about herself. Because the two major points that were picked up on the blog that were really discussed among, among many points, um, 
the first was that, okay, so this explains why so many women complain that it's not worth it to go back to work. They look at it in a very short-term perspective, how much money are they gonna keep um, out of their paycheck, um, and they decide that it's not worth it, even though it may be very worth it over the short term and the long term, and it may be worth it not just for financial reasons, but for other reasons. Um, and the second point that everybody pulled out, which to me is, was very thought-provoking, is the really critical question of why <laughs> house cleaning and childcare expenses would be taken only out of the woman's salary anyway. Why is that, that taking care of the house and taking care of the chil children is still in this country considered purely the domain of a woman. And I have had so many women cite to me how many pennies they keep after, after they've gone back after maternity leave, well, after paying the daycare center or after paying a babysitter um, and paying for this and that, when they really should be looking at it as an overall family expense and they should be pooling there in their husband's income and then looking at the childcare and household incremental expenses being taken out of both salaries, both paychecks. And we don't tend to look at it that way. We look at all of this as just a woman's issue. And it's, it's so clearly not just a woman's issue, it's a societal issue. Um, and what this leads me to is my last point that I see all the time on the blog and in, in writing the book and talking to women is that what I see is that there's really a reflexive scapegoating of women in this country um, and in many other countries. And it's by men and it's also by women. Um, everybody blames women for the challenges that we face <clears throat> in balancing work and family. And we women blame ourselves too. It's we are the first person that we blame. And the reason that I wanted to use the title Mommy Wars for my book is not because I think that there really is a war between working and stay-at-home moms. The, mo the real mommy war that takes place is inside each woman's head. Every single day as she struggles with balancing work and family. Um, our country deifies motherhood. It's one of our core values is how wonderful motherhood is. And you hear all the time it's the most important thing that a woman does in her life. And so that's really great. And when you're pregnant, everybody wants to touch your stomach and tell you how wonderful motherhood is. And then as soon as you have a real live baby, everybody runs for the hills. And I, what I found over and over again is that women find themselves completely on their own. Um, their employer is not going to help them. Their government is not going to help them. Quite often, their husbands are not going to help them. Um, because this parenthood, motherhood is seen so clearly as a woman's issue. And, and sadly, quite often other moms don't help them either. And I think that talking about these issues is what is gonna bring about change. Talking about it and listening um, and writing books. So thank you for writing this great book. It has just wonderful information in it. And um, thank you all for being, for being here today and to, for picking up these issues. After a brief pause in the program, NCPA President John Goodman then introduced the next speaker, Lyric Walwork Winnick of Parade Magazine. Welcome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kim. Um, I feel like I'm here to back clean up or something like that. But um, I wanted to sort of, I think that you all touched on some wonderful statistical issues and some other things, and I think that there are also some big core questions at the heart of this book, and that's what I kind of want to step back and look at. Um, I, I was actually reminded of this story when Lisa Belkin of the New York Times wrote a big piece, a cover story in the Times Magazine, for which she got a lot of flack, um, about Ivy League women, particularly women from Princeton, as it turned out, who had opted out of the uh, career track and were going to be stay-at-home moms. Um, back when I was a junior and happened to be at Princeton, um, the Dean of Women's Students and the Women's Center hosted a big event just for the female students in one of the huge basement lecture rooms of the Public Policy Center. They brought back eight female alumni a, who were an assortment of bankers, management consultants, uh, and one full-time professional volunteer and charitable board member to sort of enlighten us all about our options for the future. And these women were, to a T, the stereotypical baby boomer superwomen. Uh, and they were scheduled to within an inch of their lives. 
and I remember raising my hand and a little bit like the skunk at the garden party, I guess, as it turned out, and asking, but what happens when something goes wrong, when someone in your family gets sick or when there's an emergency? What do you do? What do you give up? And as I recall, three of them glared at me and nobody answered the question. <laughs> But I think that it is a question that many women have been trying to answer for the last 20, 25 years or so in the workplace, and not always with much success. And in some ways, this is a question that is also at the heart of Kim and John's book. Because the truth is, when women went to work, they did not give up their old day jobs. Women stu still do a lot of the household chores, the child rearing, the school volunteering, and the caregiving. And even when men do share these roles, it still means that in one household, these tasks must be done in addition to what everybody else is doing in the workplace. Um, I've always found it somewhat amazing that the Red Cross and other charitable organizations can calculate to the last cent the dollar value of each hour of volunteer time that's donated to them, and we can fold all this into the economy. But somehow when it seems to productivity, it comes to productivity and work, there isn't really a calculation for what it means to run a household or keep a home afloat. And it isn't always seen as adding real monetary value to our nation. But that's a lot of what women do in addition to what we do in the workplace. So what are women doing when, they, when it comes to their work lives? Well, the standard litany of options seems to be part-time work, flex time, shift work, job sharing, working as a freelancer, contract employee, even going into business for yourself. And women are doing all of those things, but actually not as much as you think. Um, the U.S. actually has one of the lowest levels of part-time work in the world, uh, in the industrialized world. It only tops out at about 13%, although women do do two-thirds of those part-time jobs. And the last option that we hear a lot about is this opting out of the workplace. Um, although, according to many statisticians, it seems to be more of a media myth and a suburban legend than an actual boatload of moms fleeing the workplace. Uh, but the opting out discussion, I think, has done a great disservice to women because it suggests, and I think this was something that came up a lot on Leslie's, on the blog um, from Leslie's column, that, that making work work for women is primarily an issue for ladies in $400 shoes with household help, and that is just not the case. Uh, like men, the majority of working women are in service sector industries. They're part of the backbone of the economy, and a lot of them are struggling to find options. I know one woman who has spent over 20 years employed at a clerical level for a private company. She now has a toddler and a baby, and she asked if she could work two extra hours a week in exchange for being able to leave one hour extra one day a week, a two-for-one deal, to pick up her children from their caregivers because, her hus because of her husband's work schedule. Her husband is a bus driver. And a female vice president of human resources at this company told her no. In the scale of the national economy, something like this is a small thing, but if you multiply that across thousands of workplaces, it becomes a big thing. And we have to start doing a better job of answering these types of dilemmas and these types of questions if we want to be a healthy, competitive, and innovative economy. And answering these questions in both a public policy format and also as private companies and private employers, whether we're big businesses or whether we're teeny tiny small businesses. More women than men today are graduating from high school and college and earning master's agree degrees. Women comprise about half of the incoming students in the fields of law and medicine and about one third of the first year MBA students. And women are starting small businesses at twice the rate of men. Women are more enmeshed in the workplace than ever. But women aren't sticking around in the top law firms or choosing the most demanding or time-consuming medical specialties, and they are only beginning to make a dent at the top in our largest companies. And women and men both keep telling all of us that they feel increasingly weary, stressed, and overwhelmed. I think what Kim and John and, and their third co-author, Celeste, have done, beyond asking some very important policy questions, is to pose perhaps the more, most important question that we face as a working society. Why does it benefit anyone to stop thinking of employees as people and start treating them as statistics when they step through the office door? 
why in a knowledge economy where people are the engine, the resource, and really the product, do we not want to do everything to maximize our human advantage? And I think that this is not a class problem or a mommy track problem or even really a, a woman's problem. It's the problem of creating a better, more rational workplace for the 21st century and for our type of jobs and our type of economy. And that ultimately is everyone's problem. Okay, we've had good comments and heartfelt comments here this morning, and now we're going to open it up for questions. And as the moderator, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask the first one. And I want to pick up on that example that Lyric gave us about the mother who wanted some flexibility in work schedule. And uh, let me just direct this one to you, Dee Dee, but all the rest of you can chime in if you want to. The federal workers have for a long time apparently had a modest amount of flexibility. And, um, and uh, everybody seems to enjoy it, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. Why is it so hard to give at least the same flexibility federal workers have to the rest of the country? Um, you know, I'm not an expert on, on the history of the legislative debates over those particular laws, but I think it's long past time um, that we do exactly that. Uh, there is no question that businesses have to change, and that's hard. Change is hard. But there's also no question that there's a lot of things that are done because it's the way they've always been done. And as businesses start to look and try to ask the question, how can we um, be more productive? How can we, I mean, one of the things that will make companies more productive is to cast the net more broadly for talent, and that means bringing in women who, uh, as Lyric pointed out, now are graduating. For every 10 men that start college, 13 women start college. Uh, and most of them finish. And in master's programs and in, and in medical doctors and in, and in law, more and more, more than 50% of incoming law students this year were women. So the talent pool, we can see where, what direction that's going. Business has to catch up with it, whether it's professional or, again, in Lyric's example, people who are not professional. And the, tru and, and the fact is, companies can do it, and when they do do it, um, everybody seems to benefit. A great example was a, was a Harvard Business Review study um, a while ago, seven or eight years ago now, where one of the big accounting and consulting firms said, why is it that when people come out of college, we're hiring 50% women, and we get to the partner track, most of them are gone? Um, and all the men said, well, it's because they're stopping to have kids. And the president of the company was a man, said, well, you know, let's actually go back and look and see. Let's go talk to those women who left and find out why. And what they found out was that, yeah, some women were leaving to have kids, but more of them were leaving because they didn't have opportunities. When the big co co contract would come up, uh, it would be an automotive contract or something that men didn't think women would be interested in, or that guy's too d difficult to deal with. We can't give that to a woman. And the women were saying, we were never given the opportunity to say yes or no. Men would decide, it's too much travel, don't offer it to a woman. The women said, w where were we in this conversation? So we realized we're never going to get the, the uh, choice assignments. We're never going to be on a track to be really senior contributing members of this company. We're going to leave for other opportunities, whether it's staying home or starting a business or whatever the choices were. And so they restructured the company, and it's been difficult. But what they found is they're keeping a lot more women. There's a lot more women on the partnership track, and they feel like they're more productive. And I think that that's a great example of what it will take to create a more flexible workplace, one that's one where women are, and men are asked, what do you need to stay? What would make you more productive? And that those answers are heard and incorporated uh, into best practices. And into the law, by the way. Go ahead. John, too, I think that this gets into, the, the question of labor flexibility gets into the complexity of changing any of these situations. You know, back in uh, the 90s when Ashcroft attempted to change, to, to, to give this flexibility to the private workforce, it was the unions who were opposed to it. Now, publicly, they like to say that it was because they were worried that this law would give employers the ability to, to abuse workers. They would force them into work schedules that they didn't want, that there were workers who, who would be denied overtime because instead they'd be forced to take uh, m m flexible scheduling. Um, in, 
the reality is far more complicated, which is that unions have long served as middlemen, as negotiators between workers and companies. And they, they negotiate not just pay, but work hours. And if you give workers the right to independently negotiate those contracts themselves, you're taking away union authority. You're taking away their, their leadership role. Um, and so there's a lot of politics that's involved in this and, and a lot of power struggles that are involved with changing these rules too. Just to, I just want to add quickly, you know, but not all workplaces are unionized, and I think especially you see in the service sector, which is basically where our economy is going, that we need to kind of put aside a union mindset maybe of what constitutes productivity and have a more flexible definition of productivity and look at productivity for people, not necessarily, and for what is going to make a most productive, you know, engaged worker, somebody who's sitting there for an hour worrying about their kids is not going to give you the productivity you want. You need to work with people on an individual basis. I mean, they are the engine for this economy, not, you know, how many widgets are coming off the assembly line. Just briefly, a point of clarification. Everything that's been said is very true. When it comes to workplace uh, laws, the laws apply to those employers who are 50 or more employees. A lot of women tend to work for individuals who are smaller companies, whether they're self-employed or whether they're small employers. The law is pretty, um, this is a bad microphone. The law is saying it is illegal if you allow flexible workplace arrangements. It is true the government has it at the federal, state, and local levels. And in addition, unions offer that as one of the uh, benefits of membership. So it is purely politics that has prevented any changes of occur occurring on Capitol Hill with regard to this legislation. Stay small. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Uh, any yes. You. <laughs> bipartisan issue. Oh, a couple of you have said this is a bipartisan issue and that these uh, matters affect both Republicans and Democrats. However, how, how would you uh, project that a change in the leadership of the House, for instance, which may occur in a few weeks, uh, switching from Republican to Democrat, uh, may uh, affect the kinds of laws you looked at in the book? How might the approach of a Democratic House uh, differ from a, from a Republican House, although uh, given, of course, that a Republican Senate could stop anything that comes out of there anyway. But Wow. Does anybody want to weigh in on that? <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the book itself, if, if you read it, and I, I totally agree with Didi that this is a bipartisan issue. Unfortunately, I think a lot of politicians haven't understood it that way. I think that women haven't been heard enough that that some of these things are still viewed through the lens of partisan politics rather than the idea that if you step up to the plate and, and, and you're actually looking after half of the population of the United States, you could come together and find some common ground. Now, the, the, the problem is, I mean, the book itself in terms of the solutions that we offer are very free market. Uh, the added benefit of some of those solutions is that they wouldn't just help women, but they'd help workers and people overall. Uh, so to the extent that uh, Democrats are take, might, may take over in the House and that you will have some leaders of certain committees who, who for instance, are, are against lower taxes or, or against, for instance, changing the 40-hour work week, that, that certainly isn't going to, to help with some of the solutions we know would actually help women. Let me just add to that that um, I think that the book does a terrific idea of identifying the problems and proposing solutions, but one of the things that has to happen is a, is a broader conversation about what those solutions are. And there's no question that you're going to run into some resistance in democratic quarters when you suggest that the solution to every problem is a market solution, because uh, there are so many examples of uh, when, without some check on, on the market, it, it isn't good for workers. And so, you know, that's, that's a philosophical divide that probably, um, you know, Kim and I don't see eye to eye on all those things, except that I think starting the conversation and allowing people from both sides of the aisle, um, men and women, to have to participate in this and say, how do we find the best possible solutions? How do we 
bring the most people into this process and find something that can move us forward. And of course, I'm going to probably be alone in this room by saying I, I think it would be perfectly wonderful if Democrats took back the House. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi was a speaker. So um, anyway, I think it would be interesting. I mean, she's a mother of five. She, she raised five kids. Um, she didn't have a traditional career most of that time, but she certainly understands a lot of the challenges. And I think it would, it would add an important perspective um, to, the, to the debate. If I could just make one very frank comment very quickly. Um, I think politicians in both parties are not attuned to these issues. Yeah. And part of the reason is that women in this city are represented by the extremes and not by the middle. And when we started out, I went to the website of NOW and I went to the website of Eagle Forum. And what I quickly understood was that, that the extremes don't, don't care about these problems. That, that on the right, they, they want to know who's going to rock the cradle and women should stay at home. And on the left, they're not that excited about marriage anyway and, and, and don't understand what a marriage tax is. So, so, so the, the women that are having the problems that we're talking about, I think, are not well represented here. But they are the vast majority Absolutely. of women. All right. I, I totally think agree. you can ask quickly, too, John. I mean, is anybody, has, has this type of topic been a question during one of the presidential debates two years ago? Is it on the agenda for any of the senatorial debates this year? Is any senator being asked, any or a senatorial candidate being asked these questions? I think the answer is no. Well, if I were there, they would be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wanted to follow up on the issue of, of flexibility. Um, I am aware of a law that has been in effect in Britain for maybe about a year now, which they refer to as the soft touch flexibility law. And basically, as I understand it, is the point is that it gives um, women and other and men a right to have a conversation with their employer about flexibility. It doesn't give them a right to a flexible work schedule, but it's a way to start up the conversation. And the way I understood it come about was that business and workers and the government all came together to have conversations about how can we help solve this problem. And one of the ideas they came up with was this law. And I wonder if the speakers are familiar with this and if you think this kind of thing could work in the United States. You know, I actually lived in London for several years and, and, and this has been a very fascinating innovation in, in Britain. And one of the reasons that the they decided to have a, uh, just simply allow a conversation to begin rather than mandate something like this is because if you look around, European countries have not actually had the best experience. Women have not had the best experience with what many people would describe extremely generous laws for women in that, you know, many European countries, for instance, mandate months and months and months of maternity leave and companies have to therefore then hire them back afterward. Many women have found that as a result it's become very difficult for them to get jobs in the first place because companies are very wary about what sort of obligations they're going to have to women when they take on the commitment of hiring them in the first place. So some European countries, and Britain is an example, has been trying to think of a different way that would actually allow the market to have more of an involvement in this and allow discussion simply between workers and employers because there probably can be arrangements made, uh, but the problem is when you actually enforce these laws on people which neither side then likes and tends to take a couple steps backward. Leslie, let me ask you a question, uh, but all of you may have uh, an opinion on this. We titled our book Leaving Women Behind, and when you put it on your blog the other day, uh, a lot of people uh, wrote in to say, well, this is, these aren't women's problems. These are couple problems. These are family problems. And, of course, we heard that a lot of, uh, from a lot of people. But on the other hand, we found that overwhelmingly it's the women who want to talk about these problems, and the men appear largely indifferent. So, <laughs> to you. <laughs> it's, it's true that <clears throat> many people on the, a lot of the conversation was just making the point that these issues do not affect merely women. Um, and they affect families overall. And maybe most importantly, from the perspective of the people on the blog, they affect kids. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think it's a tricky question, because I think that women are the ones who are most motivated to advocate for changes at work and at home. Um, but as we know, they're not in enough positions of power either in politics or in 
the private sector to make enough changes come about. So we absolutely have to bring it to men's attention um, that these are issues. Um, I remember when I was first starting to work on Mommy Wars, I would go places and, and uh, I'd sort of end up at the end of every event in a corner with you know, 10 to 20 women talking like, you know, voraciously about these issues. And every once in a while I'd run across a man who would say, God, could, could you write a whole book about working in stay-at-home moms? I, di I didn't know there was anything going on. So I think that men do sort of just, they, they bypass the conversation unless it's something that really does affect their life or unless they have a, um, an adult daughter who they're very close to, who they've seen her struggle with these issues. And I think it's a really important question, how do we get men to put this on their agenda, um, either as a political agenda or an agenda that they want to address at work as a boss or as an employee themselves? And I know one of the, the very tiny things that I did to try to bring about change, um, I used to work at Johnson & Johnson. I have, even though I'm a writer, I have mostly a business background. I worked at Johnson & Johnson and then the Washington Post on the business side. And I, whenever men would come to me and say, you know, my wife is having a baby, I'm, I'm thinking maybe of, of taking paternity leave, I would kind of jump up and, on my desk and say, you must. You have got to do this. Because this isn't something like taking maternity leave, taking paternity leave, taking family leave. is not an issue that's just for women. And it really uh, affects men and it affects our whole culture. So yeah, we've got to get men involved. And they already they do want to be involved, um, but got to bring them into the conversation much more. John, I disagree to some extent. I think most of it's because women, just like men, have to pick and choose their battles. And when you're in the workforce uh, and you're a woman of childbearing age, which most of the women who are in the workforce, you, ha you don't want to make it appear that you're looking for something that, that is not entitled to you. Yes, you're uh, eligible for a lot of leave situations, whether it's maternity leave or disability leave or whatever it is, but you don't want to come across, and pardon the expression, a whining, complaining individual. Men are the first to, uh, to utilize workplace policies and just very recently in our workplace, some, someone said, my wife had a baby and I'll be taping two, two weeks of paternity leave. And I said, number one, you're going to ask, you're not going to tell me so we can figure out what the workplace assignments are. But more importantly, you better be changing dirty diapers and staying up late at night helping to feed that baby or it's not, it, it's not deserving to you. I think one of our HR people said, you're not allowed to say that. And I said, it needs to be said. I mean, there are policies that are out there and there are people who are very willing to take advantage of them and the people in their 20s think that there's an entitlement to society. So that's part of the problem in the workplace. But women have to have a decent dialogue with their employer, whether it's government or private sector, and find a workable solution, whether it's finding somebody to do the backup uh, work that you're going to be missing. But it's got to be a nice dialogue. Unfortunately, our, law, our uh, uh, laws on the books don't allow for a lot of that discussion. It sounds like you've got a tight ship over there at the Labor Department. <laughs> Let me just add one thing. Um, I, I do think that this is disproportionately of concern to women. Um, and I think that um, it's true that a lot of times men are more willing to take advantage of certain policies because it's less stigmatizing. And uh, I'll give you an example. Shirley Tillman, who's now the president of Princeton, um, first woman to have the, 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 that job in the august 270-year history of, of the school. Um, one of the things that she saw was that uh, the tenure track for professors was, was tough because a lot of women were in the prime, you know, sort of had young children right at the time that they were supposed to be producing all the research and teaching results that would make them eligible for tenure. And so what she did was she decided to give, uh, to make it optional that you could ask for an extra year to achieve tenure if you had young children. And she went along with that for a year or two and then realized that that was problematic because a lot of women didn't want to ask for it because they didn't want to seem like they were taking advantage of a special benefit for them. But it was also available to men. So she made it mandatory that anybody, male or female, with young children in the home would get an extra year to achieve tenure. And if they wanted to ask to have that rescinded, fine, but the automatic presumption was you get the extra year. And therefore, it was no longer stigmatizing for either men or women, but particularly for women. And it's been tremendously successful, and people have felt really good about it. And it's just an example of how to be flexible and how to find ways to allow women to take advantage of certain uh, benefits or, or just adjustments uh, in order to accommodate the family uh, needs. Hi, um, this is a fascinating panel, and I actually just wanted to back it up a few years from workforce to education. Uh, I teach a women's leadership course at the George Washington University, and we've tried to fill a gap that we just think is really prevalent in the education market, which is come get your MBA, 
but we're taught spreadsheets and uh, performance, et cetera, market share, just like the guys sitting next to us. 10 years later, we're senior vice president. It's not working anymore. To what extent do you think the education market, educators in the US, play a role in starting this conversation earlier? I guess that's to anyone. I think that, I, I mean, I have actually had this conversation with, with friends of mine after graduation, and we have talked about how we felt so ill-prepared for the work world that if you weren't, you know, sort of tracked into a certain career path, you were really cut adrift, and that, you know, nobody kind of laid out in a real-life scenario what would happen to you and what some of your, your options might be. Um, so I think that I think educators do need to do a better job of this. I, I think that this is also the, an issue, though, that not just for women. I mean, we live in a fundamentally different workplace. We live in a workplace that is more contract workers, that has less job security, that has much more transition, where you really need to have a set of very flexible mental skills that you did not need a generation ago to the same degree. And I think that we need to be looking at that for kids kids and for young adults all the way through. Um, we need to be giving them the tools. We also need to be discussing this. And I, I mean, I'm not sure we have to do it in the classroom, but I think in a reasonable way, in some format, we need to be discussing, look, we have not, the previous generations have not found the answer to this work, family, life balance issue. Here are some of the solutions we've tried. Here's where they may have worked. Here's where they may have failed. You guys can do better. Don't get scared. I mean, this is a problem we can solve, but we need to think about it. I think if I, I want to add to that a little bit, education and training go hand in hand. As one of the uh, best jobs I think I have is giving surrogate speeches for the secretary, uh, t giving graduation speeches. And one of the things that I talk about, and she does as well, is um, you have to look at um, training as lifelong learning. You look at your life. It's not just what you learned in school. It's what you learn uh, in the workforce, in apprenticeships, but also uh, from other individuals. And you should always be taking courses. For women who are the stay-at-home mothers, it's important to keep your skills up because you can't step right back into the workforce when you when you finished uh, raising your children or when you think you can go back even part-time. And I know economic development uh, 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 agencies around the country are looking at this. They will not discuss education without discussing workforce training because where one leads off, you must pick up with the other. And if they're not working uh, hand in hand, there will be problems for future generations of workers. So I know the discussion has been started. And one of the things I know we've done in the past five years in looking at training dollars, we are no longer training for jobs that, that will, uh, of the past, we're training for jobs in the future. So that 85 to 90% of all Labor Department money is sent down to the local level to, through the Workforce Investment Boards. And we are only funding things where people will actually have jobs when they're through. So if you change your mind when you're 20, when you're 30, if you're laid off when you're 50, if you want to go back and get additional skills training, you can, and it's a lot easier to do it today than it was 20 years ago. Can I just add one thing to sure. that, John? <clears throat> um, one, a, a program that, is, that has been piloted by Harvard Business School and uh, a similar one by Dartmouth, Tuck Business School and by Wharton, is specifically addressing lifelong learning and how your graduate school in this case can be there for you throughout your career. And the pilot program at Harvard is uh, women who are re-entering, women with MBAs already, who have taken time off or significantly scaled back their careers um, to be with their children. How to help them get back into the game to update their skills, their negotiating skills, and to give them um, a degree that, that signals to employers that they've gotten very serious about work again. Because that's one of the problems of the prejudice is that an employer often will figure, well, if you took time off to be with your kids, you're not that serious about your career. And it's, it's, it's not true. Um, but it, uh, getting another degree is a way um, to mitigate against that. And it'll be interesting to see how the programs um, unfold. Currently, they're very expensive. Um, corporations are underwriting them. It'll be an interesting signal how e eager different corporations are to underwrite these and how many women enroll. But I think that that's one case of how uh, schools are trying to be there for their students. Uh, and I see lots of evidence that things are really changing on campus and that formally and informally, the issues of how to address work and family are really being addressed. Um, the best example was I was at, uh, at Wharton last year giving a speech 
to welcome the entering class. And when I had been there in the exact same room 15 years beforehand, you know, we'd been sitting there in our suits and trying to be all impressive, and in the exact same auditorium 15 years later, there were babies in the audience. And some of them were babies of current students, some of them were babies of spouses. Um, and I just thought, this is just absolutely incredible that in, the, in such a relatively short period of time, I mean, it felt like a long time to me, but it's really a nanosecond in terms of social change, that it had become completely acceptable to bring your, you know, screaming, crying baby to what had been a very formal, um, you know, welcome into the, the world of Wharton Business School. All right, by way, do you have a question? All right. Hi, my name is Allison Stevens, and I write for Women's E! News, um, which is a news service that covers uh, news of interest to women. But my question was about the status of legislation. I'm wondering if if there's been any movement with the, the tax laws or the flex, um, flex time laws, or if there are any other um, law or legislation out there that, that you might see moving, and you know, I guess the basic question is, what should we look to to be the next sort of family and medical leave act that can actually um, make it to the president's desk? I hate to sound pessimistic. We, we haven't had a great deal of uh, success. Uh, there has certainly been a lot of discussions about things that are on the right track. Uh, there was the tax commission that looked at flattening our, our tax structure, for instance, and a, a flat tax or a national consumption tax would be a step in the right direction. Uh, we've had discussions about Social Security, Social Security privatization, giving women uh, their own private retirement accounts, knowing that the money that was theirs because they live a lot longer than men, knowing that that was there for them uh, when when they retire would be a step in the right direction. We haven't we haven't got that far. Um, as, as we talked earlier, the flexibility issue, the last time it really came up was the 1990s. It hasn't been brought up again. There are a few things, smaller things, that are good news. We didn't really discuss here today some of the issues of benefits and how uh, current benefits law often disadvantage women. Uh, things like health savings accounts, uh, which are now starting to begin a little bit more across the country, are also that that's actually happening, and that is a good sign uh, because it's going to give women who make the majority of the health care decisions uh, in, in families today a lot more control over their health care spending. If I could just add, uh, I think the problem in the labor market generally is not that, that we have too few laws, it's that we have too many. And when I'm not writing books with Kimberly, I, I'm the CEO of, of, of a small business. And I can tell you that uh, uh, from our perspective, we, we want more flexibility. I would love to be able to say to a part-time employee, uh, if you want to trade off some wages for health insurance, that's something we'd like to do, and similarly for our pension plan. But we're always looking at the law, the tax law, and the labor law. And if somebody wants time off for anything, whether it's illness or child care or whatever the reason, then we all huddle and say, well, is this going to violate the discrimination laws if we don't do similar things for other employees? And we're always worried about the regulations. It keeps us from doing a lot of things that we would like to do. Okay, by way of wrap-up, here I want to ask all the panelists, you don't have to say anything, but is there anything that we missed this morning that really needs to be said before we leave? Do we cover one, you, one, issue. One, one issue? Okay, go ahead. Um, when you look at the uh, labor policy in particular, uh, a big, um, before a woman decides to take a job or change jobs, the biggest uh, thing she looks at is really the health care benefits and the other benefits that come with the job. And as it stands right now, you have to work 30 hours a week before anybody uh, may even offer you health care, retirement, or other benefits. So that is a huge part of the mix uh, in discussing alternate work schedules or even part-time work. So and I just want to put that out there. That's because of laws. Uh, that's correct. Because you basically are required to give everyone the same benefits. And uh, at a certain point, it's simply not economic for companies to do that for employers who work under a certain number of hours. So, And this gets into what Lyric was saying, too, about statistics. One of the reasons that we treat people as statistics is because laws have made it impossible for us to deal with them as individuals anymore. You want to say something? Yeah, All right. of course. Um, <laughs> We haven't talked very much about childcare, and you can't work. You can't go back to work. You can't go to work for a single day without good childcare. 
um, and disproportionately this means the woman can't go to work, um, not the man. And I think that you know we, it, it's it's not the most exciting subject, but it's incredibly critical to have more affordable, quality childcare. And currently, only about four percent of companies um, offer any sort of childcare or childcare support to their employees. And I think that it would be a wonderful thing to give companies more of an incentive um, to offer on-site daycare or to collaborate with other companies in the area to offer, uh, maybe not on-site, but uh, in a geographic area, a pooled child care system because it's good for families and it's really good for kids too. Um, and I will just add, um, I think women have to continue, and it is disproportionately, the burden does fall on women, have to continue to be flexible because I think the workplace is going to change. And I think um, certainly laws need to change, but I also think, look at Starbucks. Howard Schultz decided that he was going to offer health care benefits to anybody who worked 20 hours a week, and he decided he was going to do it just because he thought it was the right thing to do, and he did. And it's obviously a very profitable company. Now, not, not everybody is Starbucks, um, but I think there are ways that workplaces can innovate, and I think women have to continue to pressure workplaces to innovate. And I also think women have to, we, we have to lead men and lead the world in rethinking work more broadly. Women, demographers have identified something they call the extra decade, right? Women live longer than men. So in our post-child rearing or pre-child rearing years, there's an extra decade. Um, that's one thing that we have to factor in. That we, we need to be flexible and to say, well, we don't necessarily have to accept we have to be at point A uh, right out of college and point C and then point F and then uh, you know, point Z by, by certain milestones in, in our lives. And I think, I think it's important, you asked the question about education, I think it's important for us to continue, continue to identify role models who have redefined these things so that we can have all of us, men and women, have more choices, but particularly women. We need to change the laws where that's appropriate. We need to change the culture in the workplace where that's necessary. We need to change our own thinking to say we're not wedded to the arc of the career as it w was once written. Um, we can redefine that. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some energy. It's going to take some creativity, but we can do it. Women are going to have to lead the way on it, um, and I think we need to just get at it or keep at it. That extra decade ultimately means that women get all the wealth, you know. Well, women increasingly are controlling more and more <laughs> They wealth. may be in the nursing yeah. home, but they still get the exactly. wealth. Exactly. All right. I think our panel did a great job this morning. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you.